Duane syndrome. Here's her abnormal head position, a left turn, left tilt. She came mainly because vertical prism in her glasses was failing to give relief from her diplopia because that was also part of uh, her symptomology. If you look at her measurements first, you can see she has a fairly large left hypertropia in primary gaze with alternate cover testing. A left hypertropia that built, if you look at the photograph of her in primary gaze, the photo doesn't reflect that, but with alternate cover testing, it does build. If you look at the measurements, once again, her left hypertropia is about the same into left gaze, but if she looks up and left, it increases a bit. And she has no uh, hypertropia, I apologize, she has a uh, lesser hypertropia in left gaze. And she also has an esotropia in primary gaze that increases in left gaze with an abduction deficit, an abduction deficit. If I could direct your attention to the photos, you can see that she may have some globe retraction here when she looks into adduction, which is typical for Duane syndrome with co-contraction of the medial and lateral rectus. But look what happens when she looks into uh, left gaze. Her left hypertropia actually increases along with her abduction deficit. And that's quite unusual with Duane syndrome. Now, if you're confused a little bit right now, that's okay. Uh, I would expect you to be a little bit confused. You've heard of upshoots in Duane syndrome, but they don't happen when a patient looks into abduction. They happen when a patient looks into adduction towards the nose, usually because of restriction of the lateral rectus. And if you could look up here at this boy, he has bilateral Duane syndrome. And if you could look at his left eye in primary gaze, and when he looks into a deduction in that eye with Duane syndrome, he does have elevation of that eye. And in particular, when he looks up and right, he has quite a bit of elevation. That we consider an upshoot in Duane syndrome. And that's a typical upshoot that we see with restriction of the lateral rectus. And contrast that, please, to, to this patient. She actually has an upshoot when she looks into abduction. And it's really very unusual with Duane syndrome. So here's a video. I'm going to try to fast forward this a little bit. Watch her left eye as she looks into abduction. It's right at the tip of my finger. Goes up when she looks into abduction. So I'm going to advance here. And um, here's her exam again. And in the clinic, she seemed to have decreased force generations of the left lateral rectus. Well, what does that mean? Well, her, her lateral rectus doesn't pull very hard. How do we figure that out in the clinic? Give some alkane, make the eye numb, have the patient put their eye in primary gaze. I rest a Q-tip against the temporal uh, limbus and then have the patient look into left gaze. And if I can push the eye into AD duction, there really isn't much pull in that muscle. So she had poor force generations. And she seemed to have restriction of the medial rectus. Again, Q-tip on the limbus, but this side, this time on the nasal side, have her look into AB duction and try to push her eye into AB duction and it didn't go into abduction easily pushing on a Q-tip. So it seems that she has poor function of the lateral rectus with restriction of the medial rectus. And so I took her to the operating room because I wanted to help her with the double vision and the abnormal head position. 
and ended up finding that both the medial rectus and the superior rectus were restricted with forced suction testing in the operating room. And so the surgery uh, ended up uh, being just the, just the right amount uh, of six millimeters recession on both muscles. That was enough recession to release restriction in both muscles. And um, worked well. Here's her abnormal head position preoperatively. Here's her head position postoperatively. Pretty much resolved the turn and the tilt. And here's her exam. Her esotropia is a controlled intermittent exotropia. The hypertropia is decreased, both in primary gaze as well as into left gaze. And if you look at her photos, you can see that that upshoot and abduction is improved. If you look at this eye as it goes into abduction, that's also improved. And here's her postoperative video. Okay. I'm gonna back that up a little bit. Watch her left eye as it goes into oh, well, abduction. I can see your finger. Then move your eyes towards it. Look right at it. There you go. And the okay. upshoot is that. much improved. Now if you'll follow my finger as fast as you can. Hang in there. Follow my finger. Follow it. Follow it. Okay. Way up here. So just a, just a couple of points. This is an unusual presentation, an upshoot in abduction in Duane syndrome rather than an upshoot in adduction. I can't find that this has been um, reported in the literature. And I think it's a variant of the cranial uh, disinnervation syndromes. Uh, think of it as a, a Duane's variant. Um, the reason I'm presenting it is that an advance in our field has been transposition of the vertical rectus muscles in the presence of Duane syndrome, which is better than a medial rectus recession alone in the sense that it gives you better, a better field of single binocular vision. Look, what am I talking about? Well, a more uh, outdated, more traditional way of treating Duane syndrome is to recess the medial rectus only. And that will help you with, with an abnormal head position. Uh, but the problem with it is that you do reduce a deduction quite a bit when that procedure is done. And if you look at our patient here, her esotropia in primary gaze is a well-controlled small exotropia. But look in right gaze. She develops an exotropia. So she does have an eye misalignment looking into right gaze. And with vertical rectus transposition, that's minimized. So that's the advance of that procedure. So it's not a, it's a good procedure. But in this particular patient, a vertical rectus transposition clearly wouldn't have ended well. We probably would have ended up with some bizarre vertical deviations afterwards. So it's something to watch for in children with the Wayne syndrome. Children, of course, are notoriously difficult to examine and finding these sorts of subtle uh, variants might be difficult. So keep an eye out for it in children. One child was referred to me in that situation, I believe in retrospect. It was 15 years ago, referred in after a vertical rectus transposition for Duane syndrome with a terrible hypertropia. I actually uh, referred that patient on to Los Angeles, uh, ground zero for that procedure where Arthur Rosenbaum practiced. And uh, that child did okay in the end after additional, an additional four surgeries. Uh, finally, uh, again, this is a rare variant of Duane syndrome. Just, just keep an eye out for it in children before you operate. And thank you very much for your time this morning. Again, I hope that was calm and soothing, and I'm all done. Thanks, David. Can everybody hear me again now? You okay? You hear me? Great. We're going to move on. And I do need to say that I, I feel much luckier uh, to be moderating this session than to have been Chris Wallace last evening.
That would have been a different sort of moderator job. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Griffin Jardine, who is going to speak to us about treatments for progressive myopia, wondering whether they are too short-sighted. Dr. Jardine. Thanks, Bob. Let's see, let me just get this pulled up. Um, great, everybody, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. So, the, uh, yeah, forgive the play on words. I, um, I'm not very, uh, not typically very clever with titles, but I, I tried to do a little play on words here. So, um, I'm going to start with a case presentation of a five-year-old who had a failed vision screen sent to us from Idaho, and they uh, had an otherwise normal exam, except they were already minus two, which would be a pretty young age to be already myopic. Most kids start off hyperopic as they move towards emetropization. So talked to the family, said that we would just start with glasses, but then watch this. And within a year, they'd already progressed to minus three and a quarter. And if myopia in childhood progresses over a diopter a year, it is considered uh, rapidly progressive. And, and so uh, I had a conversation with this parent about uh, whether we should start a treatment to slow myopic progression. And in the end, they, they couldn't come down frequently for contact lens fittings, and they didn't have a compounding pharmacy to make dilute atropine available. So the, the decision was made that we're just going to watch it. Um, and I, I told them it was totally fine. So this is a natural history uh, case. Uh, a couple of years, saw them a, a year later and they jumped even more and then had a little bit of a lapse and saw them at four years and they were already minus seven. Uh, and so this is a case I just think illustrates this issue of early myopia in childhood and how rapidly progressive it can be. Um, so, and speaking of myopia, uh, you know, we're focusing on the myopia that's related to axial elongation. Um, you know, in contrast to other forms of myopia, for instance, in ROP, where we see more of an anterior segment um, alteration driving the myopia, but, or I should say laser after ROP, but, you know, my, myopia is the most common eye pathology in the world at nearly half a billion people who are suffering and qualified as visual, visually impaired due to that myop myopia being uncorrected. What's more concerning is that myopia is on the rise. Um, this is a study that, uh, you know, Future uh, forecasting is, is almost never perfect, but if you look at here in 2000, the global estimated rate of myopia was about 23%, and then in 10 years, it jumped to 28. So it jumped about five or six percentage points, and then again in 2020. So, uh, so this, was a, this was a really big um, meta-analysis study that looked at uh, over 100 studies of, of getting these prevalence rates and put it into a future prediction model and, and estimated that in 2050, we're heading towards about 50% of the population being um, myopic. Uh, and you can see the differences in various parts of the world. In North America, um, you know, we're maybe middle of the road, uh, whereas you see in some of the Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia, that they're already at, at nearly that, you know, that, well, they're already above the 50% mark. Um, in some places, they're at 90% of the population is myopic. So myopia in and of itself is, is not necessarily the problem. It's, it's the, it's the um, correlation between, or the, the um, directly proportional increase in risk with the increase in myopia. And this is, I pulled a couple of studies that showed some of these relative risks. Uh, you can see as you get into the minus six to eight range, the cataract risk is five-fold increased. The retinal detachment risk is a 21-fold increase. And then myopic maculopathy has a 40-fold increase in risk in that myopic range. And in, in Japan, in certain parts again of Asia, myopic maculopathy is becoming one of the leading causes of visual impairment, where myopic rates are really high. So um, I know this is a pretty common topic. I think we've all heard about this. This is really um, caught fire in, uh, again, parts of the world where this is um, already seeing uh, a lot of, causing a lot of problems. So one question is, why is myopia on the rise? Um, I think this is a complicated question and it's, you know, it's certainly multifactorial, but 
most studies are showing that it's predominantly environmentally driven. So one of these studies that I thought was really interesting to, to capture this point was it took families, Chinese families, families or children from uh, uh, of Chinese ethnicity who were living in Singapore versus Sydney and just did a, a prevalence of myopia study. So just a snapshot in time, but they found that children in Singapore, which would, uh, in terms of lifestyle, represent uh, you know Asia and Southeast Asia uh, more more uh, would mirror those lifestyles more. The prevalence rate of myopia. This is again children six to seven. It's like first to second grade. Their prevalence rate was thirty percent compared to just almost three percent in Sydney. And of all the factors they looked at, the one that stuck out the most as the difference between these two uh, cohorts was that the the children in Sydney were spending 14 hours a week outdoors compared to only three in Singapore. Pretty drastic difference. Um, no, significance, no significant difference in, in the parents' myopia, speaking to the genetic cause. And, and ironically, children in Sydney reported having actually more total near work activity. So there, there is a, the, the amount of time we're spending on screens, the amount of time kids are spending accommodating is thought to be a risk factor. But in this study, it was really much more so the time spent outdoors. So just to talk about this, what, what are the mechanisms behind outdoor time and the uh, arrest or um, decreased incidence of myopia? And, and the, the leading hypothesis is this light dopamine theory, which is that UV radiation and not, not all forms of light, really mainly UV radiation, stimulates dopamine release in the retina, which slows axial growth. Um, the absence of which causes axial elongation. A, a couple other theories. One of them is pupillary constriction causing less blur on the retina. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. And another one is just the idea that when we're outside, we're not, as ac not accommodating as much. So again, probably multifactorial, but I think the light dopamine theory has the most robust um, data behind it. And it's been proven in several animal models. Um, just to, sh to share another study, I'm gonna to try to just share as much data as possible uh, on, to shed more light on this topic. But there was a, a randomized controlled trial in uh, Guangzhou, China of a thousand kids, about a thousand kids who the intervention was giving half of this group that were randomized uh, an additional 40 minute outdoor recess at the end of school. Um, uh, and that extra time outdoors um, reduced the incidence of myopia by about 9%, which was uh, ended up being a, you know, about a quarter in terms of the relative risk reduction. So, um, you know, my first question is, do, do we encourage young children to spend more time outdoors to curb the incidence rate of myopia? And I, I think with all the data out there, this seems to be a pretty strong yes. Um, the next question is, what if somebody is myopic? What if a child is myopic? Should we tell them to spend more time outdoors as, as to slow the rate of progressive myopia? And, and, and that is sure, but that's probably not enough in its, in its own because the mechanism is actually changing in what's driving axial elongation once a child is already myopic. So let me talk about that. So if a child is diagnosed with myopia, what we see is, starting here on the left, so an uncorrected myopia, the myopic eye the line, kind of the focus distribution here, doesn't actually correspond to the curvature of the elongated eye. And when you put traditional correction, namely glasses and or contact lenses, you do get the central retina, the central vision in focus, but the peripheral retina is out of focus and it's a hyperopic defocus. It's focusing behind the retina. Well, we're finding that this hyperopic defocus is another stimulus for axial elongation or myopic growth. Uh, and, and that's driving um, some of the progressive myopia in, again, children who are already myopic. So this is a, 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 an image pulled from a recent study um, out of JAMA called the Blink Study that talked about um, uh, multifocal contact lenses to slow myopic progression. As you see here, so this is just a traditional contact lens. And these peripheral light rays are coming into focus again behind the retina, so hyperopic defocus. Um, when you compare that to 
a multifocal contact lens. So the, the ad power is not central, but it's in this mid peripheral part of the contact. Uh, it's causing myopic defocus on the peripheral retina. And that is the, that is the kind of proposed mechanism or theory behind a, a couple of these treatments to slow myopic progression. So again, to look at the data in, in this study, this is a really well-designed double mass randomized clinical trial here, here in the United States that was done in children seven to 11 and a, a, a decent size. So they tried three different study arms, the single vision contacts with a medium ad power versus a high ad power and the multifocal contact lens. And these are actually soft contacts, uh, interestingly. So um, the three-year myopic progression in a single vision contact is minus, was only minus one. And I think that's probably, I think contacts have been shown to slow myopic progression as compared to glasses. So that's already probably a, um, a somewhat slowed down intervention. Um, but when you went to the 2.5 multifocal contact, your myopic progression was about 40% less. Um, probably more important is the actual the axial elongation, since that's where most of the pathology of high myopia is linked to. And here we saw, you know, nearly a third, a 33% reduction in axial elongation over three years. Um, so, you know, I, I, actually, I think I, I think this is quite a sound study with. Um, support for multifocal contact lenses in this context. Um, another treatment is orthokeratology for this, um, for slowing down myopic progression. Um, so I, I don't think I fully understood orthokeratology in, in its mechanism uh, in, in this context. And um, in continuing this theme of um, trying to create peripheral retina hyperopic defocus with orthokeratology, this is on the left, supposed to simulate the, the corneal curvature. What we're doing with these lenses, we're trying to flatten the central cornea. And in so doing, as we know about the cornea, if you're gonna flatten one part of the cornea, you're, you're distributing that curvature elsewhere. So by flattening the central cornea, what we're actually doing is steepening the peripheral cornea. And that is gonna cause, again, a hyperopic shift of the peripheral cornea, not too dissimilar from the same concept that the multifocal contact lenses were doing. And, and just again, as a review, orthokeratology is where we, you know, these contacts that are inducing a central flattening, they're, they're contacts that you sleep in overnight and then you don't wear during the day to change the shape of the cornea and it can make patients independent of spectacle or contact lens wear who are myopic. You, you, you're limited in range, you know, you don't, uh, I, I spoke with David Meyer and Dick Spetty, both of whom um, offer orthokeratology to interested patients. Um, you know, they don't really push it much beyond minus five to minus six. Um, but short of that, um, this was another good randomized controlled trial. This is back from 2012. It showed that uh, the axial elongation was the only outcome because, you know, the refractive error in these patients is, is altered by the orthokeratology lenses. But they saw nearly a 50% reduction in axial elongation over two years. And just when they, when they, again, to point out the importance of addressing this in younger ages, when they divided their cohort into those who were younger, seven to eight, um, those in the control group who fell into the category of rapid myopic progression in that they were progressing over a diopter a year was about 65% in the control group compared to 20% in ortho K group. So really curbing those who are the most problematic, those who are, um, rapid myopic progressor. So, uh, you know, the third intervention I wanted to cover is uh, talking about dilute atropine. So dilute atropine uh, has really been uh, hot in the press and in the literature, uh, and uh, especially in China, they've been looking at this really carefully. Again, that's, uh, the, this is already um, a public health issue for them. So they put that together some really well-designed randomized controlled trial and the Adam study were the first two big studies that looked at this. And Adam one study looked at 1% atropine, which is represented here by this line, compared to the control group. So in the Adam study, 1% atropine actually showed an early hyperopic shift, which is pretty impressive. And then it kind of tailored off. And over two years showed that it definitely slowed myopic progression. As you can imagine, 1% atropine was nearly intolerable. This is one drop a day. The amount of uh, photophobia and um, near blur 
meant that most of these patients needed progressive lenses or bifocal. So, the, the, so Adam two study was uh, kicked off to look at a diluted concentration of atropine and to see its effectiveness uh, in both slowing myopic progression, but but hopefully finding an improved tolerance of the drop. And I love the study because this just goes to show how when you you know really good rigorous uh, science and, and these randomized controlled trials um, can sometimes reveal unexpected outcomes. So. The 0.01% was even debated as whether or not it would be valuable in this study. They thought maybe it could even be a, you know, near a placebo effect. But as you looked at the study, um, it was, there was a dose-dependent um, rate of uh, arrest of myopic progression. So the dilute atropine here in the white circle was the least effective at two years in slowing myopic progression of the four different concentrations. But they did a washout period for a year and the rebound phenomena in the other three arms was profound. And in the dilute atropine group, their rebound phenomena was uh, actually the, um, was the least. So at three years, um, they restarted all the groups on what was thought to be um, the leading contender of, uh, of, of the four choices, which ended up being the dilute atropine. So they restarted on and they saw again, a slowed progression. And, and in this study, after five years, the, the dilute atropine group showed an average of minus 1.4 diopters of myopic progression. And, and that same number was hit in the control group in, in at 30 months, about half the time. So um, again, a really interesting study. The mechanism here is not really that well understood um, as to why this atropine drop does this. But there's, a, a, there's an ongoing study uh, called the LAMP study, um, which is essentially a continuation of the ADAM study. But now we're looking at, could we do you know, different variations of this dilute atropine to see which is most effective? So they're comparing 0.01 to 0.025 and 0.05. And here you see um, that there is, again, this dose-dependent um, slowing of uh, myopic progression in that the higher concentration of 0.05% is seeming to be the most effective. So even though I'm using 0.01% in a lot of my patients right now, I think as this study continues, we may be switching to point to one of these two other concentrations. We're still waiting for the washout period. So uh, the jury's out as to whether or not the higher concentration will have a bigger rebound phenomenon like it did in the first study, but hopefully not since these are all lower. And the 0.05% was well tolerated, uh, still did not have a significant um, incidence of photophobia or um, near blur requiring glasses. So uh, again, most importantly, the change in axial length is, is, is the, the, really the, um, the data point we care most about. And again, this was shown to be slowed in the atropine groups as compared to the control group. The control group right here at one year was switched to what thought was, what was gonna, what, what the, was uh, determined to be the most effective of the three concentrations. So it was switched to 0.05. And in a year, it actually passes the 0.01%. Um, so uh, again, the next phase, it's a four-phase study. The next phase is the washout period. So that will be, uh, again, enlightening on what, uh, what, what is going to be the leading contender for dilute atropine. So let me, let me uh, end with another case presentation. This is a, this is a sweet two-year-old boy referred to me for high myopia. Uh, he was put in a pair of glasses, but on... On my exam, the cyclopedic refraction was about double what they had estimated. He was nearly minus eight in both eyes with some um, oblique astigmatism. And um, this, is, this is pretty unusual. I, I'm often surprised at how many patients I see who are even double digits in their myopia under the age of five. And, and when we see this high degree of myopia this early in age, I typically refer for genetic testing. And this child unfortunately came back positive for congenital stationary night blindness, which is associated with early high myopia. Um, the other things that we see uh, fairly commonly are fever and stickler uh, and less commonly Wagner. So um, we're so fortunate to have Emily Spothier who, who does uh, uh, navigate uh, the, the genetic testing and then the complex interpretation of, of the genetic results. I wanted to show a video of this sweet boy um, the first time he put his glasses on, sometimes I, I tell parents it's, it, it sometimes it's worth filming because it's interesting to see their reaction. So I want to ask you what you think the 
reaction is in this little boy here and what the optical properties are of his reaction. Does it feel weird walking with it? Or not weird? So pretty, pretty ironic. Comfortably it's walking just, it's around a little minus bit of an a, no problem. But then it's going to take some time, time to adjust. And you can just tell his depth perception is way off What's that? in the glasses. So I, I just I'm just gonna pause it for a second. Does anyone anyone any thoughts on what would be the driving factor there? Why would he have such a difficult depth perception adjustment to those glasses? I have actually lost let's see if I can get my chat to pull up, but what, what, while you're thinking about that, I, I unfortunately can't see the chat. I'm almost done here, then we'll open it up for questions. But it, it, my, 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 my thought was that the that minus eight has a potent minification effect, where uh, things would look further away. You could see him looking at his hands in front of his face and not being able to see exactly where um, where his hands are. So uh, I think the you know it, within thankfully a couple of days he was cruising and functioning much better than he was before the glasses. But that adjustment video I thought was quite interesting. Again, the optics of myopia. So take homes here. Um, to get back to that original question, I'm going to uh, um, unfortunately belabor the uh, play on words, but I, I think actually it would be foolishly myopic to ignore this growing problem. So I think the treatments have really good um, data to support them. You know, orthokeratology, we're, we're so worried about this idea of sleeping in contacts and the uh, risk of microbial keratitis and, and the incidence rate in, in the studies where it was, uh, where there was uh, Patients were really well uh, instructed and in how to take care of it. That it was it was about one per thousand of uh, corneal ulcers, and we're so fortunate to have David Meyer and Dix Petty. That uh, at least amongst there may be other optometrists in our group, but I know those two specifically do offer all of those contact lens options for patients who fall into this category of being high risk for progressive myopia. I think the UV exposure in early childhood is uh, definitely something that we need to be thinking about. Um, it's uh, pediatricians are pushing for kids to have more time outdoors for uh, dozens of health reasons. And I think our, uh, we're at a public health crisis where the, the amount of programmed busyness that ch children are facing and the kind of early uh, aggressive academics that we're seeing are, are causing them to have all sorts of issues, including increased um, depression and anxiety that and I, I'm going to let out my own personal uh, parenting philosophy here, but I, I think we do need to let kids be kids and have a lot of unstructured free play time, especially outdoors where that uh, UV exposure has a lot of health benefits to them. With sunblock as a redhead, I have to speak on that. So um, the, uh, uh, lastly, if a child is myopic under the age of nine, and especially if it looks to be progressive, we ought to think about um, offering one of these interventions. There's other ones. I, 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 these were the three that I really thought stuck out and had the best and the most supportive data. And I do use a lot of dilute atropine, and, uh, and, but I just think it's a conversation worth having with parents. Uh, and here are my references. Uh, it's really a pretty, um, you know, there are just hundreds if not thousands of studies on this right now being done, especially in the parts of the world where it is an issue. So on that note, let me stop my screen share and just open up for any questions. You're welcome to chat in right into the chat if you have any questions. If you want to be unmuted, uh, raise your hand or say in the chat and we can unmute you as well. Griffin, I'm not hearing a lot of questions. I think you must have made the issue uh, very uh, clearly in focus. Um, Perfect. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> so I think we'll go ahead and uh, move on. Our third presentation. Wait, I have a, I have a oh, question. You have a question. Well, well, you better ask it. Um, so I have two questions. Griffin, what's your thought on what's what, why atropine works? I mean, uh, I guess there are several theories on that. And um, uh, I think the leading one is they don't really know, but just kind of curious what you found looking in that. And my second question is, like those kids with congenital stationary night blindness or things like that, you don't 
do you treat those kids? Um, just curious on when they have other pathology, what, what's your thought on myopic progression when they've got other, other things going on? Yeah, uh, great questions, Mimi. Um, to, to, to the first question, uh, I, 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 mean, I actually, the theories are all over the place and they don't really have much um, support on any of them. I think there's a biochemical theory that atropine is having some effect on, on the eye. There's the other theory is causing, um, uh, you know, is there, is there some way that it's potentially decreasing that peripheral retinal blur? And, and that doesn't really pan out either. So I think it's one of these things that works, but for reasons that are unclear. I, I, I didn't come across any compelling theory that really uh, made sense or that I thought was very supported, well supported. Uh, to your second question, the challenge with these patients that have an, another reason to be myopic um, is that they, the exclusion criteria in all these studies was all these genetic conditions and ROP and and so we don't have any data to really answer the question about what to do in patients that have, for instance, ROP and that's probably a different mechanism. They don't it's not necessarily axial elongation or I mean, again ROP uh, with laser or uh, like a Stickler's patient. So I've been pretty conservative because I, I just don't I don't uh, I don't know if there's I don't think there'd be much risk of doing dilute atropine in almost anybody. Uh, I think you could discuss it with family and just mention that it's an, there's, there's, there's not enough data to answer whether or not it applies to their specific child, but it's likely safe enough that it could, you could try it. That's, that's probably where I stand on that. Yeah, no, just curious. Great, yeah. great, great review. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mimi. Are there other questions? Griffin, great review. One quick question. Within um, kind of the Moran system, uh, are, are we then, if we're seeing these patients or, or having, uh, you know, acquaintances, et cetera, are, are we supposed to send everyone to you directly? Are there others who are doing this? Uh, and is this the sort of thing where you know, you'd feel comfortable with uh, our optometrist, comprehensive ophthalmologist, um, you know, prescribing this and moving forward with dilute atropine? Yeah, it's, it's Jeff, I think this is um, thankfully fairly straightforward. And uh, I know everyone in our division um, is uh, uh, you know, open to, to using it. And I know the optometrists are really the ones who have been the, I think the predominant leaders in, in driving a lot of these um, really well-designed randomized control trials. So our optometrists are perfectly capable in managing this. I think you do need to have a really careful retinal exam uh, initially, if it's a really high myope, you got to think about genetic testing and maybe even an examiner anesthesia looking for fever or doing a fluorescein angiogram or peripheral breaks. If they're sticklers, you, sometimes we pre-treat those um, with laser or cryo. So once you've kind of thought about those things, if it's just a, a young kid under the age of nine and they're, and they're myopic to any degree, I typically see them back in six months, sometimes even less, but I watch to see if their myopia looks like it's progressing quickly. And if it is, then I just have a conversation with the family. And uh, the, the Moran is about the best compounding pharmacy with the, the, the cheapest price for prescribing dilute atropine. And it's in the, it's in Epic. I actually went to the pharmacy committee and had them add 0.01%. So it pulls up. You don't have to write anything about compounding or diluting it a special way. So I think this is really, this should be feasible for anybody who is seeing kids and interested. All right, other Bob, questions? Bob, could I make a quick comment? Yes, you can. Uh, a very basic point, but important. Cycloplegic refraction on children is important because kids accommodate readily and you might um, make a diagnosis of high myopia where there actually isn't any, it's just a accommodating child. Or progression without cycloplegic refractions could be Diagnosed so you, you, cycloplegic refractions for the you know the trainees, medical students. That's that's really the gold standard to diagnose high myopia. Go go ahead, Mimi. There's a couple of questions in the chat, but why don't you go first, Mimi? Oh, Mimi looks like you're muted again. Can we unmute Mimi? I'm trying. <laughs> Talk to you. Oh. oh, sorry. I. I think it's a safe treatment as well, and I've got kids on it, and even considering putting my own daughter on it because I'm quite myopic myself.
it got muted again. I think somehow, sorry. Okay, right. we, Did you hear what I said? The last thing we heard was you're continuing, you're putting your daughter on it because oh, you're myopic uh, yourself. Brian Stack has a question too, if you look in the chat. So um, looking at Stack's question. Um, so in teenagers and older kids, um, you know, I think the, the, the highest, you know, one of the leading risk factors for the rapidly progressive myopia is being under the age of nine. So if they're older than nine, they're at a lower risk for the, again, the, the real rapid progressive myopia, which is going to take them into that minus seven plus range or minus, you know, more than minus seven. So, um, but I think it'd be totally, totally reasonable if you're seeing a, a teenager to just recheck it in six months and, and try to get a trajectory of where they're heading. And it, to David's point, I think you want to do both of those as cycloplegic refractions, just to be absolutely sure that you're, uh, um, getting the, 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 the absolute measurement of the amount. But I think, I mean, to add to that, yeah, teenagers, you can for sure put them on it. Um, this isn't just to prevent, you know, pathologic myopia. It's just to prevent any kind of myopia. So uh, I think it's a pretty low risk treatment. And if parents are interested, um, yeah, I think you could definitely put teenagers on it. Agreed. And I was going to add one other, uh, or to answer one other question from, it uh, looks like from Roger about how much pupil dilation is there with dilute atropine. Um, uh, very minimal, almost none. So I think if we go to the 0.05%, maybe we'll see a little bit more, but these patients rarely have any difficulty with photophobia again or um, uh, near blur. On that note, we'll better turn the time over while we have uh, to Catherine to finish off, and then we could answer maybe any questions if there's time left at the end. Great. Okay. Catherine, who's going to talk to us about neurotrophic keratitis? Dr. Who, you're up. All right. Can everybody uh, see my screen here? Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. All right, so today I'm going to be presenting a um, pretty memorable case to our service. So this was a, a two-year-old Navajo boy admitted for poor weight gain and malnutrition. This was in May 2018, and it was pretty striking. He was in the zeroth percentile for weight and had only gained about 0.15 kilos uh, over the past two years. He also had gained less than half a centimeter in growth and length in the last year. And so we were actually consulted for aid and management of a known non-healing core ulcer in the left eye, for which he was previously followed by a provider, an ophthalmologist in uh, New Mexico. So the parents said that they first noticed about like a small white dot in his left eye with redness, irritation, as well as eye rubbing. And this was starting in January uh, 2018, which was about five months prior to this presentation. And so he had been initially um, managed with Vigamox every Q2 hours, and then had been tapered down as he started erythromycin ointment, as well as autologous serum tears six times daily. Um, some additional history, he was born full term and healthy. Interestingly enough, he did have also a five year old sister with failure to thrive, um, but otherwise his family history was non contributory. And he does live in Monument Valley in Utah in Navajo Nation. Um, and we had actually seen him on prior outreach trips and he had normal exams at that time. So he was admitted with uh, elevated liver function enzymes and also a whole uh, host of other um, vitamin and uh, electrolyte and nutrition derangements. And interestingly enough, on his neurologic, uh, sorry, neurologic exam, he had absent reflexes as well as a wide base gait. So on our, on our initial bedside exam, he was alert, interactive, and he didn't really uh, appear to be in that much discomfort. His vision, pupils, pressure, and motility were all normal and appropriate for his age. But most notable, he had a uh, 0.5 millimeter paracentral corneal ulcer at five o'clock with about 30% central thinning. And he was noted to have decreased corneal sensation on that side compared to the right. And his dilated exam was normal. So unfortunately, uh, he did have worsening appearance of his uh, corneal ulcer uh, despite aggressive topical treatment. So he underwent an EUA with Dr. Jardine and was found to have an increased size of the epithelial defect, now about two millimeters from the original uh, 0.5 millimeters we saw on initial exam, as well as increased erosion and thinning. And his ulcer had this very striking kind of excavated appearance, almost looks like a divot in the cornea with uh, very minimal to no infiltrate and minimal stromal haze. Uh, 
So because of this, we elected to proceed with an amniotic membrane graft with a contour lens, and we used a double layer technique AMT to slow disintegration and promote healing. We also used a contour lens, which is essentially a large 18 millimeter diameter bandage contact lens. And this can be good uh, to use in the pediatric population since it is so big, um, it stays in a little bit better. It kind of tucks in and prevents irritation from those adovicral sutures. And it also concentrates the AMT um, to the cornea for full effect of, and promotion of healing. So this is kind of a timeline of this very stubborn non-healing corneal ulcer all the way from first presentation in January to when he went to the provider in New Mexico and then all the way to uh, it was about five or six months uh, when we had um, when he underwent surgical intervention with us. So on post-op day, um, I'm just going to move this screen over here. Uh, so on post-op day five, when he saw Dr. Dardine in clinic for follow-up, the amniotic membrane had mostly dissolved, but the left eye definitely appeared dramatically more quiet, and there was decreased thinning of that two millimeter corneal ulcer. So he was instructed to continue Vigamox as well as the uh, serum, uh, aut the autologous serum tears every two hours. And unfortunately, when he came back two weeks later for follow-up, the two millimeter ulcer had again increased uh, thinning to about 50%, and he was taken ne the next day for a repeat AMT. So again, he underwent an EUA, and we did elect again to perform the double layered AMT technique and also the contour lens. So um, about one month later after the second AMT, he still had a pretty, uh, he, the size of the ulcer didn't really go down, um, but, and he still had pretty significant thinning, um, but there was, um, it had started to re-epithelialize and kind of become more of a scar. And so he was actually supposed to follow up one month afterwards, but was uh, somewhat lost to follow up. So about six months later, he came back for a follow up in December 2018. And miraculously, actually, the epithelial defect had completely healed and the thinning had near resolved. And at this time, he was just really using artificial tears for lubrication. But what had really, really changed in terms of his in terms of his systemic health was that he had significant improvement of his nutrition status and caloric intake with a G tube and supplementary enteral feeds as closely followed by GI and also the liver clinic. So this is a slit lamp photo that was taken at that time, and you can see that there is a well-healed he well uh, corneal scar, uh, just inferior to the visual access, and significant improvement of thinning, uh, as well as kind of more fill-in and distribution of that prior corneal ulcer um, site. Uh, so in summary, we have a two-year-old who has a non -heal who had a non-healing neurotrophic corneal ulcer in the setting of failure to thrive and severe malnutrition. And if you recall, in addition to his ophthalmic findings on initial presentation, he was also uh, noted to have liver dysfunction and absent reflexes, as well as a broad-based gait on neurologic exam. So on a very thorough workup, our patient was diagnosed with a rare condition and that is known as Navajo neurohepatopathy. This is also known as uh, hepatocerebral mitochondrial depletion syndrome. And it is almost exclusively seen in uh, children and young infants and children of uh, not Navajo Native American descent. And incidence is estimated to be about one in 1600 live births in the Western Navajo reservation. And so, it is an autosomal uh, recessive disorder, and um, they have found that it is caused by a mutation in this MPV17 gene, and this codes for a protein on the inner mitochondrial membrane that is thought to be, uh, that, that has helped to, thought to maintain mitochondrial DNA that is crucial for reliable production of energy. Um, and it has been postulated actually that this mutation is closely linked to the high concentration of uranium in the drinking water of the Navajo reservations. Um, and they have identified this genetic defect by blood samples and homozygosity mapping, um, which is, have been published in case reports in the literature. So uh, clinical presentations of Navajo neurohepatopathy, uh, they can include liver disease, corneal anesthesia, and subsequent ulcers, of course, failure to thrive, as well as peripheral uh, neuropathy and acral mutilation, and acral mutilation being um, um, injury to uh, hands and feet and limbs due to loss of sensation, as well as cerebral leukoencephalopathy and recurrent metabolic acidosis, and also uh, recurrent infections due to poor healing and, again, failure to thrive. 
There are three major phenotypes described for this disorder based on presenting age, and that is infantile, childhood, and classic. So for the infantile phenotype, this is a presentation prior to six months, and the patients usually present with jaundice and also peripheral and CNS demyelination. They also have, unfortunately, very severe liver disease, and um, a result of this is liver failure and death prior to age two. Um, the childhood phenotype is actually very similar to the presentation of the infantile phenotype, just that the age of presentation is one to five years. They also have jaundice um, and also peripheral and CNS demyelination, as well as um, pretty profound liver disease and death within, within six months of their initial presentation. And this last form, the classic form, is progressive and not really associated with any disease, um, rather, sorry, any uh, age group, but it's more progressive um, and classically associated with this moderate liver damage and characterized by a more progressive neuropathy. And so um, peripheral and CNS demyelination can present in any three of these phenotypes. Um, and the peripheral neuropathy, um, of course, is thought to be uh, played a major part in the pathogenesis of their neurotrophic corneal, uh, uh, corneal sensation and corneal uh, keratopathy. So some additional history in our patient. So he does have a confirmed genetic mutation of that MPV17 mutation. He also, uh, a convenient part of the history that I left out is that when he was four months old, he uh, presented with jaundice and hyper bilirubinemia, and he underwent a liver biopsy, and the microscopic findings of his liver biopsy at that time were suggestive of a mitochondrial disease, and that's kind of what kicked off uh, this workup. Um, for his neurologic workup, he has fortunately had normal MRIs without leukoencephalopathy, and uh, his sister also has a confirmed genetic mutation of that same MPV17 uh, mutation. Um, he is considered to have a mild and moderate involvement without evidence of portal hypertension, splenomegaly, ascites, or thrombocytopenia. And aside from a mild motor delay, our patient is doing very well with maximizing his nutritional status and replacement of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So I know as residents, uh, most of us are familiar with causes of neurotrophic keratopathy in adults, including classically, you know, topic and topical anesthetics, um, iatrogenic injury after surgery, and herpetic infections. Um, but I wanted to take some time to discuss the differential of congenital neurotrophic keratopathy, as these can be more rare entities that we don't really encounter as much. So the first one is Riley Day, or familiar uh, familial dysautonomia. This is autosomal recessive and seen almost exclusively in patients of Eastern European Jewish descent. And you can see here with conjunctivalization of the cornea as well as um, a dense stromal scar um, in a patient with Riley Day. Um, another one is golden har, which we classically learn from Dr. Mamelis, is uh, associated with a limbal dermoid as well as a preauricular skin tag. And these are associated with embryologic um, kind of defects in facial and uh, facial and, um, development and also the ear. Um, but these patients can have uh, corneal pathology due to decreased uh, tear, film, uh, tear film production, as well as um, some postulate that there is a a hypo development of the trigeminal nuclei. And then the last one on this that I was going to discuss is Mobius corneal hyposthesia, which is a very, very rare um, disease entity. And it's thought to be due to a non-progressive uh, paralysis, congenital, congenital paralysis of cranial nerve six and seven. So the facial and ab abducens nerve. So corneal pathology in this disease entity is more thought to be um, exposure keratopathy, though some have also postulated that there could be maldevelopment of, the, of cranial nerve five as well. So our patient um, was actually just seen two months ago, follow up in July 2020. Uh, he's now five years old and his, he's doing quite well. He just started reading, reading the vision chart and his vision is 2030 in the right eye and 2040 in the left eye. And um, everything in terms of his exam is, is pretty stable with the cornea. Um, aside from some um, ano, ano, anisometropia and irregular astigmatism in the left eye that we were following and treating with glasses, he's actually doing, doing very well. And um, just reading his liver and GI notes, he's also continuing to do very well with uh, G-tube feeds and they're transitioning him to NG-tube for his supplemental feeds. 
So some takeaway uh, points that I wanted to just highlight on Navajo neurohepatopathy. Overall, it is a very rare disease entity caused by this uh, MPV17 mutation. However, because we are, uh, because we see these patients on outreach trips, or even in Salt Lake City, um, any patient with failure to thrive, kind of a nonspecific liver failure or liver disease and neuropathy, as well as, of course, any corneal findings should raise suspicion. And um, patients with mild involvement can actually do very well with maximal survival benefit and quality of life by addressing their nutrition status and promotion of healing um, and things like that, though a lot of these patients will unfortunately have a poor prognosis requiring either liver transplantation or significant rehabilitation. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. I'd like to thank Dr. Jardine and also Dr. Tina Mamelis. She was, I think, the resident that had um, done a lot of um, work on this case and also was the first uh, consul resident who saw him initially. And so I'd gladly take any questions. Uh, these are my references and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Catherine, that was a great presentation and kind of underscores um, the plight of the Navajo, particularly Monument Valley, where a lot of the uranium mining occurred and uranium is in groundwater, in food sources, and mine slag was used for uh, house foundations. Uh, you know, interesting to me in that you look at this uh, 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 Navajo neurohepatopathy, the genetic component, and whether that all was caused you know, by uranium exposure, and then continues to be a heritable defect that these people are saddled with. Interesting that your patient came from Monument Valley, which mm -hmm. was ground zero for uranium mining is, is also, I think, very significant part of their plight. Um, great presentation. And Thank you. Bringing this issue up, it's an important one. Thank you. Other questions, comments? If not, we'll thank you all for joining us today and let everybody get on. Now let's just look here at the anything in the chat that we need to, to pass on here. Um, I think we're okay. Okay, I think I think we're set oh, as well. What, one quick comment from Ashley Bernheisel, if you see that Dr. Hoffman. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and actually I think that, actually what Dr. Bernheisel raised was that vitamin A deficiency may actually have been involved, and that was, uh, I think, corneal xerosis uh, um, with um, vitamin A deficiency, very rare to see in the U.S., um, but uh, I, I agree. I think that may have been a strong component here in terms of the nutritional improvement. Um, it really takes a lot of work to become vitamin A deficient in the U.S., but this child may have uh, been a setup for that. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Remember to uh, uh, claim your credit. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.